take your Bibles and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And then when you get there, mark your place and uh, I want you to make your way to Ephesians chapter 6. So Deuteronomy chapter 6, mark your place and then move on to Ephesians chapter 6. I heard this sermon preached recently and I knew that the people at my congregation needed to hear it. Now, we're going to be speaking about a very um, selective subject matter. But before I even tell you what it is, I don't want anybody to check out. All right? The sermon I want to preach this morning begins with this statement. It's very tough being a parent. It's very tough being a parent. Anybody want to raise their hand and testify? Say amen. For those of you that have gotten rid of your kids because your grandparents or even great-grandparents maybe. But I don't want anyone to check out because if, if you've been a parent or even if you haven't been a parent, there's some principles here that I really think we can all take and get something from. So uh, we're going to speak about parenting this morning. It's tough being a parent. A number of years ago, James Dobson, most of us recognize him, uh, wrote a book that was called Parenting Isn't for Cowards. Parenting isn't. For cowards, and being the father of five girls, I totally agree. Nothing compares. There's no job, there's no career, there's nothing that can possibly compare to the awesome responsibility that we are given to rear, a raise another human being. There is nothing that even comes close. Now the problem with parenting, right, is right about the time you feel like you've got the experience you need, right about the time you think you're turning the corner and you're making progress, they leave, right? The job job is over. Our children graduated, they move on, or whatever it is. But truly, the job of being a parent is never over. And as I said, being the father of five, I am reminded daily that in no way, shape, or form do I have an edge on it. Do I have it all figured out. But here's one thing I do know. To be the type of parent that God wants us to be is not an accident. I have a little sticker in my office that I put my eye on quite a bit uh, when, we're, when we're planning things, when we're doing things, or just in life in general. And the, and the, and the uh, little sticker says, excellence is never an accident. Excellence is never an accident. And as we strive to be the parents, even the grandparents, aunts and uncles, whatever connection you had with children, as we strive to be this, the excellent parent that God wants us to be, it can never be an accident. Okay? Proverbs 24.3 says this, By wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established. Let me say it in a different way. It takes wisdom to have a good family, and it takes understanding to make it strong. What are you trying to say, Pastor? Well, I'm trying to say the Beatles, they're not right when they say love is all you need. Love is all it takes. It's just not true. I have seen countless parents who genuinely love their children and yet lack wisdom in how to raise them. Proverbs 24.3 is a great verse because it makes it clear that not only should we pursue wisdom, but we should continue pursuing wisdom in the area of parenting if we desire to be excellent parents, if we desire to be the parents that God wants us to be, if we desire to build strong families. Now let me make sure you understand something. Wisdom is not just intellectual knowledge. Wisdom and knowledge are different. We can have all the knowledge we want about parenting, even from the Bible, and it's there. But until we take that knowledge and we actually apply it in our lives with our children, in whatever context God has put that in, it does no good whatsoever. Now, you need to know that it's tough. Because with our children, context is never the same. How many of y'all would be willing to raise your hand and say, things are different now than when you were a kid, right? Right? Now, some of you, that was a long time ago. I know things were different, but let me tell you something. I'm 43 years old, and things were way different when I was a kid than they are now. Things that kids are exposed to in kindergarten and elementary school, the generation maybe previous to the oldest person in here, were never exposed to to start with, ever, 
And we live in a world where this context changes on a daily basis, rapidly changing. Now you compact that, compound that with the fact that every single child is unique with a unique personality and unique needs and wisdom when parenting our children can be incredibly elusive. Now here's something we should all be thankful for. God is not silent on this subject matter. Amen? This morning we're going to take a look at the two passages that I just talked to you about. We're going to stay pretty much focused on them. Ephesians chapter 6 and then Deuteronomy chapter 6. We're going to have a few other supporting scriptures. But between those things we're going to see some clear instruction from the Bible that can assist us in growing as parents, in growing as grandparents. Now we could spend weeks and weeks. The Bible is full of instruction for parents and full of instruction for dealing with children. But today we're just going to look at some highlights. We're going to look at five principles. If you want to be a wise parent, if you want to increase in your wisdom as a parent, then these five principles are something definitely that you're going to want to know about and begin practicing or further practice them. Number one, wise parents... Embrace their role biblically. Wise parents embrace their role biblically. A pastor friend of mine pointed out an article which absolutely blew me away. Uh, but the more I read this one simple statement, the more I realized how true it is. Let me read it. In America, we are not as progressive as we think we are. Because one of the first things you notice about any backward third world country is this. Their children obey their parents. Let me read that one more time. In America, we are not as progressive as we think we are. Because one of the first things you notice about any backward third world country is that their children obey their parents. Take a look at Ephesians chapter 6. Verses 1 through 3. I'm going to read it this morning. I'm reading from the ESV. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with promise, that it may go well with you and you may live long in the land. Now let me tell you something. In this three verses, Paul has laid out the principles of parental authority. I need to make sure you understand this. God has placed the parents in charge of the home. The parents are the agent of authority. And if a child does not learn to submit to the authority of their parents, what makes us think that a child is ever going to be able to learn to be submissive to the authority of an employer? Or, or the, the, the authority in another a, a college or in any authority to start with. If they cannot embrace the authority of the parents, they're going to struggle their entire lives with authority, period. Now here's a sad fact in our nation today. We have a whole nation, multiple generations of children who are proud, self-centered, and indulgent to their own desires. Why? Because no one ever let them know they were not in charge. No one ever let them know they were not in charge. And parents, as the one who God has placed in a position of authority, we must do this. We must hold them to the biblical expectations. Our expectations should be biblical expect expectations. And what are those expectations? Two words, obey, honor. Obey your parents and honor your parents. To obey is to do what you are told willingly and unconditionally. To obey is to do what you are told willingly and unconditionally. But folks, that's only half the equation. The other half is this, to honor. And what is to honor? To honor is to obey in a way that glorifies God with your attitude. So we're to obey willfully and unconditionally. And then we're to honor, obeying in a way that glorifies God with our attitude. One man said it like this, obeying is doing the right thing and honoring is doing it the right way. And parents... 
if we expect anything less, I don't care what the world says. I don't care what Dr. Phil says. I don't care what the latest copy of Parenting Magazine says. If we do anything less, we are only reinforcing the idea that obeying God's commands are simply an option with not so bad consequences. And not only does it shape and mold our children's character incorrectly, but can I tell you, and you can see this in our country today, it has a drastic effect on society as well. If you don't believe me, let me give you a couple of uh, examples. I want you to listen to a portion of an article that I'm going to read that was found in a journal of education. A disgruntled teacher handed in her resignation with the following comment, and I quote, In our public schools today, the teachers are afraid of the principals. The principals are afraid of the superintendents. The superintendents are afraid of the board members. The board members are afraid of the parents, and the parents are afraid of the children. And the children, you want to know who they're afraid of? Nobody. Nobody. I read of another godly woman, a great example, another godly woman who had recently retired from the field of education. And she said this, and I quote, If I had to start over again as a teacher today, I am not sure if I would do it. Someone asked her why, and this is how she responded. And I quote, Simple. When I first started teaching, I was clearly in charge of the classroom. When I retired, the students thought they were. Now, folks... This is a problem, and the problem exists today. But you need to know where this problem starts. It starts in the home. It starts with mom and dad. It starts starts with children who are not taught and who are not held accountable to the biblical standards of honoring and obeying their parents. Folks, when a child will not submit to their parents' authority, ultimately they are not submitting to God's authority. He has given an order of authority in the home. And when they will not respect their parents, they are not respecting God. And they need to know this. We need to make them aware of this. They need to understand the implication of when they obey or disobey you. They are obeying or disobeying God. Mom and dad, if you want to know the clearest way to tell in your home if you have forfeited this principle, here it is. How often do you find yourself negotiating for good behavior instead of expecting it? We don't, we shouldn't have to negotiate for good behavior. We should just expect it. And when it's not there, then we deal with it. Wise parents embrace their role biblically. Number two, wise parents correct their children appropriately. Two words I want you to hear there, correct and appropriately. Ephesians 6, 4 is where we're going to be based out of. But virtually no environment is more unwholesome for a child than a nominally Christian family where parents name the name of Jesus but neglect to provide the proper loving nurture and admonition that the Bible talks about. What do they do? Well, more often they consistently model sinful correction and Criticism. Ephesians 6, 4 is a great place to start with this. There's also a parallel verse in Colossians 3, 21. Both of them say this. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. Now, men, as a general rule of thumb, in practice, we are so much more often harsh in our discipline of our children. So it's no accident that in both of these verses, the father is used. The term father is used. But please Don't take it to mean that the principle in general does not include females, does not include mothers also. What is the principle? You ready? It's really really important, but I think it's one that we've forgotten. You ready? We are to correct our children. We are to correct our children. It's black ink on white paper in the Word of God. Proverbs Several illustrations of stronger verses that talk about the lack of discipline. Proverbs 19, 18. Correct your children while there is still hope. Do not let them destroy themselves. Proverbs 13, 24. If you refuse to discipline your children, it proves you don't love them. Ouch. 
So the principle of correction is taught over and over and over in the Bible. But the warning in Ephesians 6, 4, the warning in Colossians 3, is that when it comes to correcting your children, there is a right way, yes, but there is also a wrong way to do it. There is a way to do it incorrectly. And it's not going to produce wisdom in your children. It's going to produce anger. It's going to produce bitterness. Now, before I go any further, I need to make sure you understand this word of clarity. This is not an instruction. Ephesians 6, 4 doesn't give us any instruction in saying, hey, don't properly uh, correct. Don't properly discipline your children because it might make them mad. No child, including me when I was a child, none of my daughters enjoy discipline. At times, I'm sure it makes them mad. There's a difference. 6-4 is talking about appropriate anger for them because of inappropriate discipline. But don't ever think, well, I'm not going to discipline my child because it might make them mad. <laughs> Are they going to be happy? Yay, I get a spank and I get a spank. No, that's silly. So make sure you understand that. But it needs to be applied correctly, which means there is an incorrect way to do it. Incorrectly is provoking anger. Somebody pointed me to a book written by a man named Lou Priolo. It's called The Heart of Anger. In this, he uses 25 examples. He gets real practical about what it means to stir up anger in a child, to incorrectly discipline them and then stir up anger. I'm not going to go over all 25 so you can breathe easy, all right? I'm just going to hit five of them. I, I want to actually read what the author says about each. The first, right, you want to stir up anger in your children. You want to be guilty of what Ephesians 6, 4 tells us not to do. The number one, lack of marital harmony. I think it's kind of God ironic that it has really nothing to do with the kids. It starts with mom and dad. Lack of marital harmony. As a child observes the resentment that results from his parents' lack of harmony, the author says, he becomes more susceptible to acquiring the traits that he has seen modeled by them and he or she is defiled by their bitterness. The absolute best thing you can do for your kids as a parent the absolute best thing you can do for your kids as a parent. The absolute best thing you can do for your kids as a parent. I said that three times. Each member of the Trinity needed one of those, okay? Work hard in building a great marriage. Work hard in building a great marriage. When my one, when both my younger brothers, but I remember, I remember very just like it was yesterday when my brother John had his first baby. She's, she's working on two years old. I talked to him one day. And of course, I'm not an expert, but I've got greater experience than he does at raising kids, especially girls. And he said, what's the biggest piece of advice you could give me about raising John Lee? That's my niece's name correctly. He said, you want the greatest advice for raising John Lee correctly? Love Morgan like the Bible tells you to love her. That's his wife. Treat Morgan like the Bible tells you to treat her. Be the husband that God wants you to be. Period. Number two, you want to stir up anger in your kids? Habitually discipline them while you're angry. It's the parent that uses the sledgehammer to drive a thumbtack. We're all guilty of it at times. It makes your motive for discipline seem vindictive rather than corrective. Punitive instead of redemptive. Biblical discipline is training in righteousness, not exploding in frustration. And we all have done it. It's the truth. If I could go back and undo anything in regards to disciplining my daughters, I would go back and correct myself on the times when I have disciplined out of anger. In fact, if they were here, and they will be in the second service, I would make it clear to them and clear to you, you they could testify, all of them, that there have been many times when I've had to get down on my knees so I'm at the same level they are. Well, I don't have to do that with Kayla anymore. But most of them get down on my knees so I'm at the same level and simply say I'm sorry. Not for disciplining you. You deserve the discipline you got, but I disciplined you incorrectly. I disciplined you out of anger and not out of love. We do not want to make that a common practice because it can drive our children to anger. Number three, disciplining our children in front of others. Simply put, the goal is correction, not humiliation. This is real simple. It's not easy, but it's real simple. Remember this rule. Praise publicly, 
confront privately. Praise publicly, confront privately. Number four, should I compare them to others? And to all the people said, no, no. Don't compare your children to others in their bad behavior or in their good behavior, right? When you're correcting them or when you're building them up or when you're complimenting them, I should say, it's all building them up. Don't compare them to others. Don't compare them to their brothers and their sisters. If you're going to compare them to anyone, compare them to the biblical standard and compare them to themselves. What do you mean? Well, proper biblical comparisons may be made in the following direction. You can go forward. What I mean by that is what the author means by that is by comparing where the child is today to the biblical standard of maturity. It's okay to take your kid and say, this is where you are today, child X. This is where the Bible says you need to be. This is where you are. And then backward, by comparing the child's spiritual maturity today to his own spiritual maturity at various points in the past. It's okay to take your child and say, hey, listen, I've seen God grow you. I've seen where you've been in your spiritual maturity. And look, this is is what I've seen. And now here's where you are. Let's talk about this. But you're always using a biblical standard. Number five, failing to keep your promises. Failing to keep your promises about discipline for sure, right? How many times have we promised, have we made a commitment? Have we said, you're going to be disciplined over this, and then for whatever reason, well... But in general, failing to keep promises. We've all made promises with great intentions. We simply were not able to keep despite our desire. However, when promises and commitments to events are consistently not kept, a child's sense of disappointment can quickly turn to anger. Now, before I move on to point three, I want to throw something in there really quick because it's very important. When it comes to correcting our children, when it comes to disciplining our children, moms and dads, and I realize that in some cases we're just dealing with single parents, but in normal cases, moms and dads, you got to be on the same page. And you both have to be disciplining them. You know, our goal when we discipline our kids, when I discipline my daughters, I always look at them and I say, girls, you know I love you, right? I love God and I discipline you because I love God, but I also love you. This is why I do it. If I didn't love you, I would let you keep on doing what you're doing. But I want you to learn that when you disobey, when you rebel, when you go against authority, no matter how much Satan deceives you to think it's good, it's going to end bad. Eventually, it's going to end bad. Eventually, you're going to feel pain over sin. I said, and so what your daddy's trying to get you to understand is that right now, while the consequences are small, right? Whenever it's grounding or spanking or time, whatever it is, the consequences are small. I'm trying to get you to learn now so that when the consequences are big, when the consequences could involve jail or, or other things like that, life endangerment, you've already learned when the consequences were small that sin leads to destruction. Sin leads to pain. Now, I don't want to get off on a tangent because that's important for our kids to know, but it's also important for our kids to see that from both mom and dad. Mom and dad have to be on the same page because if we're not, you want to know what the kids are going to see? They're going to see it's more about a personality than it is about a discipline, than it is about a principle. Well, this must be important to mom, or this must be important to dad. And I don't want to do this when dad's around, or I don't want to do this when mom's around, because the hammer's coming. You see, they don't really see it as a principle that's important that comes from both parents. Wise parents correct their children appropriately. Number three, wild, wise, not wild parents. <laughs> Wise parents instruct children intentionally. We instruct children intentionally. If you've got your Bible open, you can flip back to Deuteronomy. We're done in Ephesians. You flip back to Deuteronomy. In fact, chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, I'm going to go ahead and read it. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. 
I love how one man said it when he said it like this. And man, this is so true. I wish Josh was in here because he would scream out, amen. Hold on just a second and you'll see why. For many, for way too many families, the thought process goes like this. Well, as a parent, it's my job to feed my kids. It's the school's job to educate them. And it is the church's job, the pastor's job, the youth pastor's job to disciple them. Folks, if that describes your strategy, the man says, then first, you are wrong. And second, you could almost mark it down that there's a good chance that disciple making is not going on in your home. The passage that I just read to you is a, if it was the only passage in the Bible, it, was, it would be all that was necessary to show you that when it comes to making disciples of your children, it should be never outsourced. The discipling of our children should never be outsourced. You don't have to be a, a Bible scholar to observe the fact that way before Pastor Josh's role was established, mom and dad were established. Way before the church was established, husband and wife were established. Mom and dad were established. Now listen to me. There's nothing wrong with using the church. There's nothing wrong with using a school for education, whether it be a public school or a Christian school or home school, whatever it is. There, there's nothing wrong with using a youth group and a youth pastor and, and a Sunday school teacher and a pastor. But listen, it's got to be gravy. It's got to be gravy. What does gravy do to a meal? It doesn't supplement the meal, right? You, you don't take the, 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 the plate of great food, mashed potatoes. I've already talked about it being Muffin Sunday, and it's not, so we're just going to take it. It's, you can't have a plate full of roast beef and mashed potatoes and corn on the cob and all that stuff. And you don't shove that aside and go, ooh, there's a boat full of gravy. Oh, ew is right, ew. Gravy doesn't supplement the meal. What does gravy do? complements the meal and it's the same thing with the church and schools and a youth pastor and a pastor and a Sunday school teacher it should all be gravy parents should not be bringing their kids to church and dropping them off and saying hey let the church teach you about Jesus we shouldn't be doing that Christian parents must intentionally instruct so pastor how do we do that well I'm gonna give you two vehicles number one family worship Now, before I go any further, I want you to know that your pastor is not perfect at this either. I understand what it's like to live in the 21st century with schedules that are just maxed out and things going on. And we don't always have time on a daily basis to sit down and take 30 minutes and let's just dig into the word and let's do all this stuff. I'm not saying that can't ever be done and it should. But listen, family devotions don't have to be like that. You can talk about a verse, you can sing a song, you can talk about truth. We all ought to be able to find some time in our day, even in our conversations. And that's number two, right? Number two is teachable moments. Not only should there be, uh, for lack of better words, a time for devotions in your home, but there should also be teachable moments. Can I tell you that that's what verse 7 and 8 in the passage we just read were talking about? Let me go back to 7 and 8 in Deuteronomy 6. You shall teach them diligently. It's talking about the word of God. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand that they are like frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Now I want to talk to you from two points of view on that passage. One, descriptive and historic and then the other, prescriptive for what that's telling us to do today. In the descriptive mode, in the historic mode, it's talking about these little things called frontlets. You see that in this verse. They can also be called phylacteries. They were a pair of small black boxes. And in these were parts of Scripture. Four passages from the Word of God were written on these parchments. And according to ancient Jewish tradition, they were fastened. These black boxes were fastened with black straps to the upper left arm of the person or across the forehead. And these were to be worn as tangible reminders to not only live out the word of God, but to talk about the word of God. Now, I'm not asking anybody to go home and get some black boxes and put scripture in them and tape them on your forehead. 
Our kids already have enough reason to call us dumb, right? But what I am saying is this. As I fast forward to today and take that descriptive and turn it into prescriptive, it is talk about God's word at home. There are countless opportunities throughout the day where we can take just ordinary occurrences and turn them into teaching moments where we can talk about the Word of God, where we can talk about Jesus, where we can talk about how would He have handled this. We must be taking these times to teach our children. The moral and biblical education of the children back then was accomplished best when the parents, out of concern for their own lives, as well as their children's, made God and His Word the natural topic of conversation which might occur anywhere and any time during the day. And guess what? Work worked back then. We'll work today. Because God's word is eternal. It's unchanging. It matches the God whose word it is. We need to be looking for teachable moments. Hear me. If your kids only hear about Jesus when they come to church, and maybe, just maybe, once or twice a week in some little Devo moment we have at the house, you want to know what they're going to treat Jesus like? You want to know what they're going to treat their Christian life like? Like that fine set of china that you only get out on certain days of the year. And to them, the Word of God and the teaching of the Word of God and living it out is really going to have no practical day-to-day value. There is a huge, marked difference between a family that just attends church and one that consistently is saturated in conversations at their home about the Word of Life. Use everyday situations and connect the decisions and choices that our kids have to make to the Word of God. Wise parents, number four, affirm children consistently. A wise parent affirms children consistently. Sadly, statistics make it absolutely clear that in the generations we have today of adults, lots and lots of adults are ruined or at least drastically affected by criticism that was harshly used, wrongly used, and too much used in the formative years. And yet, I have never heard of anyone who was negatively affected because they had too much genuine, appropriate affirmation. Period. This whole philosophy is, well, I told you I loved you once, and if anything changes, I'll let you know. Folks, that doesn't work for marriage, and it doesn't work for parenting. We need to understand that one of the main reasons we need to be affirming our children is because our children are creatures of God. Our children were designed by God. And therefore, just because of that, if there was no other reason to affirm them, they have inerrant value just because they're God's creation. If you don't believe me, listen to these passages. Psalms 139, 13 and 14. You made my whole being. You formed me in my mother's womb. I praise you because you made me in an amazing and wonderful way. What you have done is Wonderful. Now let me give you two key words that go hand in hand with the correct type of affirmation. Are you ready? Attention and affection. Attention and affection. Affirmation. True biblical affirmation of children does not reach its full potential apart from attention and affection. 1 John 3, 18. Dear children, let us stop just saying we love each other. Let us really show it by our actions. Romans 12, 10. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Now, I'm going to make this statement. And it may shock some of you. It may offend some of you. But it is absolute truth. Mom and dad, your kids would rather have your attention and affection than anything else you could give them. Your kids want your attention and your affection more than they want a new car, more than they want money, more than they want a bigger house, more than they want a boat, more than they want six vacations, more than they want a trip to Disney World. Your kids desire, it's a God-given desire, to have affirmation from their parents that includes attention and affection. 
We need to be treating our children according to what the Bible tells us they are. What is that? Psalms 127. Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from Him. If we believe this, it will play itself out. It will be displayed because we will affirm our children with attention and affection. Number five. Number five. Almost done. Wise parents, follow Christ authentically. Wise parents, follow Christ authentically. Now, of all the principles we've talked about today, this is the most important. I've saved it till last. Why? Because if we don't have this, if we get this wrong, the rest of the principles are irrelevant. They do not matter. You want to know what it would be compared to? It would be like somebody slamming a home run, but missing first base on the way around. That's what this is. How many times have we heard, well, I grew up in a family that went to church publicly, but privately it was a different story. Sad. When you look at verse 5, turn with me back to Deuteronomy 6, and we're going to look at verse 5. Deuteronomy 6, 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. When you look at 5, you see... The choice that parents have to make to be that example, to follow Christ authentically, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your might. Sum that up in one word, wholeheartedly. And then when you love Him wholeheartedly, you, you, it will, in all aspects of your life, it will be out there. And your kids will see it. When you look at verse 4, you need to know that verse 4 is called the, the Shema. Right, And this was important because it was the central propositional truth within all of Judaism. It involved their claim to one God in a land that had people in a culture of many, many gods. And once a person claimed this truth, then the personal application uh, was expected. That's verse 5. So verse 4 talks about that God... And then verse 5 talks about once you've put your faith in that God, here's how it should play out. Now it's important. Because if you do everything else right with your kids, and yet you're not passionately pursuing Christ yourself, it'll work for a little while because they're young. But as they get older... They're going to realize whether or not you're playing church or being church. Simply put, if you're not following Christ, you cannot pass on what you don't possess. Let me say it another way. You cannot lead. I cannot lead what I do not live. Period. One day, I pray, and I would pray that this would be your goal too. One day, I pray that someone will come up to each one of my daughters and will ask them what makes them different. Will ask them how they made it to the age they're at and kept making good decisions. Will ask them how they've kept their faith, their character, and all of that. And of course, I want them to give full credit to God. But when they say something like, and where did you get this? Who taught you this? I want them to be able to look at those people and say, it's all we knew. Because that's what we saw our mom and dad doing. I want them to be able to see, say, and we went to a church where the majority of people, we saw them doing that. It wasn't just talked about. It wasn't just forced on us. It was lived out. And because it was lived out, we saw it. The good, the bad, and the ugly. We saw God forgive. We saw God work. We saw God uh, supply. We saw God, and we wanted it. And when we went home, We saw the same thing going on with mom and dad that went on at church. Oh, they weren't perfect. Yeah, they messed up. Dad was a dork. He messed up a lot. What's the thing you heard your dad say the most? I'm sorry. But he said it, and he meant it. And he would try his best striving to live out how God wanted him to live. That's why 
I'm sorry I don't have a simple answer, but if you want a simple answer, I hope my daughters say, it's because we saw God in mom and dad. Do you want that? Grandma and grandpa, do you want that? Aunts and uncles, do you want that? I close today with this simple quote from a father. A father who, for all intents and purposes, is done raising, meaning the kids are gone, married, away, doing stuff. And the quote from the father really sums up these five principles that we should all be striving to apply in our lives. He says this, My family's all grown and the kids are all gone. But if I had to do it all over again, this is what I would do. I would love my wife more in front of my children. I would laugh with my children more at our mistakes and our joys. I would listen more even to the littlest child with the dumbest story. <laughs> I would be more, how true is that at times? I would be more honest about my weaknesses, near, never pretending perfection. I would pray differently for my family. In fact, instead of focusing my prayers on them, I'd focus them on me. I would do more things together with my children. I would encourage them more and bestow more praise. I would pay more attention to little things like deeds and words of thoughtfulness. And then finally, if I had to do it all over again, I would share God more intimately.